Good morning, Kansas City. It is 9 a.m. and it's time to start 1 Million Cups again this week. So we'll give you guys a couple of seconds to wind down your conversations in the back of the room. But if you would, start giving your attention up here to the front. We've got a few announcements for you and some speakers to get going as usual. Wow, that actually worked really well. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so. Welcome to One Million Cups. This is an educational event that we put on every week here in Kansas City and also several other cities around the country. We're really excited about getting going. Um, I was in Denver last week actually, um, getting some things going there. Awesome, incorporating more people into the One Million Cups family. They were really, really excited to be a part of the program. But for those of you that have not been here before, what we have is, I'll have a couple announcements here in the beginning, and then we have two presentations. Each presenter has six minutes to present some information about their startup, get everybody up to speed, and then there is 20 minutes of Q&A directly to follow. That is really where we see the value of the educational experience, where you get to engage with the entrepreneur. So, you know, you guys have experience that that entrepreneur doesn't have. We like to see that engagement and that interaction to help bring experience to local community uh, businesses. So that's basically the structure. And uh, I've got a couple announcements again. First, housekeeping. Thank you very much to the Kauffman Foundation for letting us use their space. Um, it's a really big deal and we love being able to be here. So as part of that, be sure to make sure all of your cups and trash make it back to the trash cans in the back of the room. That helps keep the Kauffman happy and helps let us use the space on a continual basis. Um, also, we have a little housekeeping note. The Kauffman Foundation Conference Center is not available for pre or post One Million Cups meetings unless scheduled through the Conference Center or Kauffman Labs. Even if a room appears to be open, they are set for upcoming meetings for groups who have scheduled meetings for their organizations. Please feel free to use the gardens across the street for your meetings. So we love being able to facilitate the conversations and the connections um, in the community. Inside this room is a great place for that, but especially these rooms like right outside here, um, those are reserved for other groups. So be aware of that and go through the proper channels if you want to use a room. Um, next, we have an announcement for uh, One Week KC is coming up next week. And if you haven't heard about it, Entrepreneurship Day at the K is part of that. And we've got an announcement for that as well. So if I can have um, Joanne Gavert come up here, we're going to play a really quick video for you all. And then she's going to make an announcement. Baseball and business make America great. Join us for Entrepreneur Day at the K on June 25th. Specially priced tickets include a tailgate party. Go to royals.com slash E-D-A-Y. Good morning. Anybody recognize that voice? Cameron, where is our star? There he is. Good job, Cameron. Well, good morning. I'm Joanne Gabbard, and I am helping with One Week KC in, in the capacity of Entrepreneur Day at the K this year. How many people attended that last year? Anybody? Excellent. We had a good time last year. It's back this year even better. We are starting One Week KC with Entrepreneur Day at the K on June 25th. Last year, we sold 1,500 tickets. To date, we're only at about 500. Kauffman Foundation is sponsoring a, an event Prior to the game, the gates open for us with E-Day tickets at 4.30. You will get a wristband. We're in the outfield experience this year. I think the batting cages will be open. You'll get a free t-shirt, but we need you guys to buy tickets. We could probably double our tickets if everybody today could just buy two tickets at royals.com backslash E-Day. So we hope you'll join us. The mayors will be there. They are going to be presenting some awards to some all-star um, entrepreneurs for 2013, and we hope you'll come out and join us. 4.30 at the K, royals.com backslash E-Day. See you there. Thank you, Joanne. All right, um, next we have the Northeast Kansas Business Entrepreneurship Academy here with us, right over here. So if you guys want to raise your hand, just like give us a little wave, a little bit, yeah. So be sure to connect with these guys, talk to them about what you're doing. Yes, thank you very much for being here. Um, and up next, I think we are ready for our first presenter. So if Hunt wants to come up here, we'll get your presentation up.
I'll let you find your file there. It should be on the desktop there somewhere. Okay. <clears throat> This one? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, Hunt is here with KC Curbside Glass. I was able to connect with him um, a few weeks ago and talk to him about what he's doing. And he's solving a really simple issue, which is recycling doesn't pick up your glass. I'm sure many of you in the room have had that problem. I did uh, when I just moved a few months ago. It's like, wait a minute, you're not going to take my glass. So being able to have this uh, come through the, the, the system is really great. So give him a warm welcome, and we'll get right into it. Thank you, John. I'm going to put this in the center real quick. Okay. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to have one disclaimer first before I start, and that is uh, in order to calm my nerves being up here, I'm watching, looking at you guys all in your underwear. So <laughs> feel, feel free to do the same to me if you get nervous. So um, I'll go ahead and start now. Uh, so my name is Hunt McGee, like I said, I'm the owner of Casey Curbside Glass, and honestly, I started this uh, company purely out of frustration. Like John said, um, most everything else gets picked up at the curb. Your trash, uh, every other recycling item, most other recycling items, um, and even in some locales, uh, yard waste. But uh, I moved here from North Carolina about a year and a half ago, and I was kind of thrown back that they didn't take the glass. So. Purely out of frustration, and after watching my neighbors and friends, we have a very social neighborhood where I live, a lot of glass was going into the trash, um, and that upset me a lot. So I started this company. So pretty self-explanatory how the service works. Um, we have a couple different plans a customer can use when they sign up. It's, uh, it's $10 a month. It's, and you have three billing options. You can choose to pay monthly. You can sign up for a six month plan or you can sign up for a 12 month plan. If you sign up for 12 months, you get one month free. So it basically knocks your, your price down to approximately $9 a month. Um, once you sign up, we deliver the fancy blue bin to your, to your home, like with the flowers in there. Uh, you put your glass in the bin, pretty easy. That actually was a real customer. Um, and we pick it up twice a month. So two weeks worth right there. Uh, I'll tell you that bin right there weighs about 50 to 55 pounds with all the glass in it. So it's, it's a lot of glass. We pick up the glass and we deliver it to our friends at Ripple Glass. And we have, we have someone here from Ripple Glass today. Um, and yes, those two of those are my kids. I'll let you decide which two. And what we're working on now, uh, working on contacting the municipalities that we're actually uh, servicing. Right now we're in Olathe, Overland Park, and Leewood. I'm sorry to say we're not this far north, uh, but there is an option if you live in the Kansas City area or the northern Overland Park area, and that's called Atlas Glass. So uh, look him up. Uh, the owner is Damon Wittenborn. He's a great guy. I support him wholeheartedly. Um, also, I'm working on contacting multifamily home associations, apartment buildings, condo associations, um, planning days to meet glass recyclers at Ripple drop-off bins. Um, Ripple did an informal survey of people bringing their glass to the drop-off bins. Uh, close to 70% of them said they would rather have someone pick it up at their curb than hauling it in your car to the bin. Um, also in the process of applying for a MARC grant, Mid-America Mid -America Regional Council, um, so I can get bigger, more equipment, and also to help with advertising. And I'm, I'm constantly in contact with uh, homeowners associations and neighborhood associations um, to try to contract directly with them. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of you may or may not know, um, a lot of the homeowners associ associations or neighborhood associations actually contract directly with the uh, trash service providers, Death and Ball, Town and Country, some of the others in the area. Uh, and I'm working on doing that as well. And that can bring my cost per, per uh, resident down dramatically. And plans for the future. Our goal is to get to about 500 customers and then begin hiring. Um, we really want to start hiring people to get more people employed in the community. Uh, we're expanding our service to Missouri real soon because we are 
applying for a MARC grant, and that in order to be, uh, to be eligible for the grant, you have to be in Missouri as well. Uh, we're con uh, our, we hope to contract directly with HOAs and neighborhood associations, and also with local businesses. Uh, a lot of liquor stores in the Kansas area uh, need recycling. And uh, we want to increase the amount of glass recycled in our area to at least 30%. We're currently at about 15%. And our goal is to donate $10,000 to local charities. Uh, potential challenges, getting the HOAs to sign up with us, uh, expanding our territory too fast, uh, and then increasing competition as with any business. Lastly, we have partnered with Harvesters for 2013. Uh, and we're donating 10% uh, of our total revenue, not our profit, our total top-of-the-line revenue to harvesters um, as our way to give back to the community. Did I make it in time? Yes. All right, thank you very much. And we'll open it up to questions to get things going. Remember, you can picture me naked. Don't be nervous. Or in my underwear, not naked. <laughs> it's too late now, right? I'll go back to the beginning. Question right here. You were talking about doing a... Where are uh, you? Where are you? Oh, like way over okay. here. <laughs> talking about possibly expanding into different businesses, one like that, and I think one of the biggest industries in Kansas City that needs recycling and help with pickup is the restaurant industry because they throw a ton of glass away. Have you reached out to the Restaurant Association or anything like that yet? I have not uh, in the restaurant business, but Ripple Glass, um, the representative sitting right in front of you, um, they have a lot. Um, they're trying to get their, their large purple drop-off bins into parking lots of, uh, as you know, uh, grocery stores, restaurants if possible, um, bars, bars is a huge one. Um, so I'm, I haven't gotten to that part yet. I'm kind of working up from the small to the large. A uh, question near the middle. First of all, I'd like to commend you for your commitment to the nonprofits in Thank Kansas you. City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify, is the $10,000 included in that 10% to harvesters? Oh, that's just a goal I've set for my company to reach. Um, you know, Once we get to a certain level, obviously that 10%, you know, that's just my original goal to get to. It'll be, once our business grows, grows, um, it'll be more than that, hopefully. That's not a cap. That's just my, my initial goal. Okay, so are you looking only at harvesters to give, or are you looking at other No, we just, just to starting off, we just started three, not quite three months ago. Um, so I just, we just chose one charity to start with. And we are, once we get through the 2013 uh, fiscal year, we're going to open it up and actually take recommendations. And it seems like um, there's a good connection between you and Ripple Glass. Is there a way Ripple Glass might contract with you? Because I know they actually make products that they sell from the glass. It's not just, you know, getting it out of our landfill. Um, that's a good question. Um, well, I don't know that they would ever do that. Um, I don't want to talk for Michelle here, but uh, I, I work very closely with Ripple Glass. Um, I promote Ripple Glass as well for areas that I'm not even in. Um, we have a great partnership. And obviously, they get all the glass that I collect. It goes straight to them. So um, we haven't, uh, they're, the director of Ripple Glass has contacted me about helping them in the areas that I do not cover, getting more of the ripple glass purple bins like mine to, to more areas. Uh, so we're currently working on that. Question to your right. First of all, I love your Kansas City Royals underwear. It's perfect. <laughs> well done. <Darn> it. <laughs> um, no, I'm curious about the feasibility of the revenue. So you say about $10 a month per resident. Um, I was also thinking how you could perhaps gain some revenue from Ripple Glass since you are providing them with uh, you know, a resource. But is $10 going to you know, be lasting? Gotcha. Good question. Um, $10 per resident is a viable uh, revenue stream. Um, as we get, uh, we just started in March and April and May, we were profitable. So that's good. <laughs> um, 
Ripple Glass will, will pay for the glass. It's, um, it's a small amount, uh, and it's by ton. So I don't have the equipment. That's where the market grant comes in. I don't have the equipment to haul many, many tons right now to them. Um, I'm actually glad to give it to them <laughs> right now until I can get um, a larger customer base and a, a larger equipment to get it to them. Back here to your left. I'm curious how your costs will scale if you enter, well, even when you enter Missouri. Will your distribution be cheaper at that point, or how will that work out? Um, uh, good question. Uh, I'm hoping it will be. I'm hoping it will be. Um, my goal is to really go into individual neighborhood associations. I can really lower, if I can have a large concentration of customers in one area, it is so much more feasible for me as well as cheaper for the customer. Um, so as I move into, I'll, I mean, we'll probably move into Missouri this year uh, very soon. So um, the feasibility the cost is, it's, it's very doable. Um, and we're actually very excited to do that. Right here in the middle. I think this is phenomenal. My, I have a couple questions. Number one, where are you located at right now and can people sign up? Yes, um, if you live in Olathe, the city of Olathe, um, I'm also in Overland Park and Lee Woods, south of 435. So if you live anywhere in that area, uh, I also just had someone sign up in Stillwell. I don't know if anybody knows where that is, but that's way south. Um, so, I, you know, I'll go, there's not a whole lot of residences south of 175th Street on, in the Kansas side, but um, you can sign up on the website curbsideglass.com. It's very easy. We have a sign up page. You just fill it in. You pick your plan that I talked about, your monthly, your six months, or your 12 month. Um, so if you're in my, my current territory, please sign up. My second question is what kind of vehicle picks it up right now? Right now, I actually have a, a, a trailer attached to my SUV. Um, and it's, it's just me doing it. So, um, and it's actually, if anybody ever wants to try this, it's a good workout. <laughs> 50 pounds a time and then, on the, I, you know, I, my trailer can hold a little over a ton of glass and it gets pretty full each time. So. And my last question is, what do you do if someone puts trash in the container instead of glass? Great question. I, I actually remove it myself. Um, and put it where, like, I'll get re other recycling items as well. Um, sometimes cardboard, uh, plastic bottles. So I, hopefully I do a good job of, of removing those items and putting them where they're supposed to go. Uh, and I actually will, sometimes I, if any of you follow me on, on Twitter or, or Facebook, I'll post a picture of, sometimes I'll get to a, 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 a ripple purple bin and there'll be cardboard boxes that have been left plastic bags that people actually did a great job of bringing to the ripple bin and dropping off their glass, but left their trash on the ground. Um, so I, I'll clean that up too. And I usually do a sweep because it's a lot of glass gets out there below it. So I try to clean that up as well. Another one back here to your left. What's your profit margin? Uh, right now about 52%. Another question to your right here. A little follow up on that. Oh, sure. Okay. Is that before or after your 10% donation to Harvester? That's after. Nice. Um, question to your right. So, what does your relationship look like with municipalities? I would think this would be something that has been in the works or has been on the drawing board of a lot of groups around town. How, is, how does that look moving forward? Are they going to eventually take over your areas or are you going to? franchise this out and continue out from Kansas City? It, right now, it doesn't look like the municipalities are going to do it themselves. Um, it's a whole nother, glass is tricky. It's a whole nother level of trucks and people to pick them up, more equipment. Um, so um, I'm actually in the beginning stages of talking like with the city of Olathe um, and Leewood and Overland Park about just having them let their residents know, you know, I'm, I can do what I can, but it's, it's so much easier if the, if the cities will say, hey, you know, let their residents know, we have glass recycling, and here's where you can go to sign up for it. Um, and actually, that is, I think it's Boise, Idaho, 
they had a similar situation we do here in Kansas City area, where they, they, their municipalities didn't pick up their glass as well. And a company like mine started and partnered with the city of Boise, and it was kind of partnership with them, and they, that's how they got the word out about glass recycling. So that's my, uh, that's my goal, is to do the exact same thing. And we have a follow-up. So the question would be, if this works in Kansas City, where else to go? Where are you there? going with it? Yeah. yeah, I've actually had somebody ask me that before. One of my friends to say, "Well, if you're successful here, you know, there's other areas in the region um, that would love this service." And I actually had somebody contact me from Branson uh, about a similar situation. I would love to do that. That would be a, a great goal. Uh, and another question back here. Yeah, just to follow up to the work with your municipalities, first of all, are the, are the cities that you're working with now welcoming this as a service? Um, I would think that uh, it helps, you know, in that whole waste stream thing. And then going forward, because your, your little box goes in the public right away, what do you need from the municipalities you want to work with in the future? Do you need to sit down with public works people? And, and what do you need them to hear from you? Yes, um, the, it's interesting. Each municipality is different in many ways. Um, city of Aletha picks up their own, they have their own city uh, disposal services. Over in the park is Deffenbaugh, I think Town and Country, a couple others, and uh, Leewood's similar. Um, so they've been very supportive to answer the first part of your question. Uh, I have to get licensed. Uh, some of them are very easy. Hope there's Overland Park people here, but Overland Park is very difficult <laughs> to get to get licensed. Um, I actually have my SUV out in the parking lot, and I have a big sticker on the side of it, on both sides really, that usually go on large trash trucks. Um, first time that's ever been done, so that's kind of cool, but it's also kind of annoying to have those stickers on your car. Um, but they're very supportive. When I apply for my licenses, they ask a lot of questions, you know, what can we do to help you? Uh, they're very, very supportive in that way. Um, and they actually have been my biggest fans. You know, come on in, do it, that's great. Uh, I think too, it's, uh, I think to go back with what I was all talking about talking to each individual city and getting their support was, now they'll have, you know, basically a single stream uh, where everything is going now, all the, it'll just be me involved in that stream. Um, so they're very excited. Uh, I know the, I, I spoke to the representatives at Leewood initially, in, in Leewood initially. Um, they were, the people I spoke with, well, you know, how can I sign up? Let's go, let's go. Yeah, they were very excited about it. So um, in terms of um, some, some cities, in terms of having a bin out, uh, putting it in on the curb versus trash cans, they, some, some have rules, some don't. Uh, over in the park again, I had to write out a whole, you know, how the bin goes, what happens if an animal gets in it. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff you never think about, but, um, but they've all been very supportive. Question for you right back here. Do you have any plans in place regarding potential encroachments on your business by the, the large waste management firms if and when, again, you grow to the size that they perceive you as a threat? Yeah. I. Um, <laughs> perceive me as I'm not a threat <laughs> um, yes I have uh, and actually initially when I met with ripple glass to discuss this whole venture um, that they we discussed that I don't I haven't been uh, run off the road by a death and ball truck yet um, I, <laughs> no one I haven't have not uh, come across any hostility from any of the companies um, I, all I do, do know is to start, for, I just use Death and Ball as an example, and they're great people. Um, if they were to start picking up glass as well, then they would have to buy those big trucks just for the glass. $250 million a pop. I'm uh, $250,000 a pop, I'm sorry. Whew. That was like, whew. $250,000 a pop for a truck, um, plus the, the, the labor to pick it up. Um, so it's that would be their, so they do trash, recycling, yard waste. That would be four different um, runs. So I think what's going to happen, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, you know, it might happen down the road where 
my customer base gets large enough, they might say, well, hey, he's, he's already got it there for us. So all we have to do is take it over. If that happens, you know, we'll come that day. But right now, I haven't had any issues. I'll, actually, sometimes the, uh, I'll get to my glass bin, it'll be empty. And they have dumped it in the trash by accident because they, they didn't know. Obviously, it says my name on it. But, so we, we, that's the only thing that's happened. Next question to your right. Good morning. Good morning. I have two questions. The first is, like, are you picking up glass in your Mazda? Or, because we talked about vehicles, and you haven't really said what you're using. I think you said SUV. Yeah, well, I have an SUV with a trailer on the back. So I, I pick up the glass, dump it in the trailer, um, and that's it. That was okay. easy to get Okay, we're, we're, and then so what are you going to do from there? You want to, uh, you got to get a special, you're going to get a bigger truck, you got to buy a $250 million <laughs> airplane. That would be great. Right. <laughs> um, my next step is to get, uh, you, can actually, you can actually have trucks custom made um, for glass recycling. Uh, I'm looking for not a garbage size truck, but they make them slightly smaller where you can actually just dump it and they have little side grooves. Uh, side openings, or I can just dump it straight in there. Um, so, yeah, my next step would be a, a custom uh, a glass truck. Okay, the other the other question I had, and I want to do it kind of quickly, but did you do market samples? Did you do a bunch of research before you got into this? Did, and how long did that take? Or did you just start buying bins and putting them out? Hey, I, you need glass, bam. Almost, almost. No, no. I, um, uh, I would say, gosh. It might have been October, October of 2012. I um, the frustration built to the blowing point of seeing everyone throw their glass away, uh, and that's when I contacted Ripple Glass. And initially, I had just started a neighborhood program in my own neighborhood. We have a little over 200 homes in there in our neighborhood, and um, I just went to my neighbor and said, "Would you be willing if I gave you a bin? Would you be willing to put it in there?" and put it to your curb and have me come get it. Would you be willing to do that? And I had 25% of the neighborhood signed up in five days. So that was kind of my initial research. <laughs> um, and so that's then, um, you know, after talking with Ripple Glass for a while, and um, I finally just like, you know, even there's, there's 100, in my, in my territory, there's 100 and, let me do the math, I think there's 170, thousand households and you know if I can just hit one or two percent of them you know you're talking you know 1700 to 2000 homes so every little bit counts but the, the market research was basically me getting out and seeing how, how people uh, received it and everybody has received it very well um, I think a, a lot of people what I've encountered the most is hoarders. There's a lot of hoarders out there. They save their glass, they save their glass until it becomes too much. And then they, they have no way of getting it to the uh, drop zones. So um, those people love me. <laughs> I get to their, their initial pickup. I'm not kidding. One of the, I wish I had a picture of it. One of the initial pickups was my bin, completely filled. Three trash cans about this big, completely filled. Two boxes this long and this deep, completely filled. Um, they alone filled up half my trailer almost. Uh, so the reception has been great. Well, I got your last question over here. Okay. Um, Kyle and I were uh, getting creative back here. And, um, awesome. you know, we thought it would, so I want you to speak into a little bit, like, you're picking up people's glass recycling, so you, you, you can see, wow, these people really like Bud Light, or these people really <laughs> like Boulevard. You know, and maybe another potential revenue stream is doing advertising and promotions back to these guys, like putting it in the bin uh, for, for Budweiser or for Boulevard. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> maybe not so much Bud Light, but the Boulevard people, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, or, or potentially partnering with Boulevard printed on their box to encourage maybe the first month could be free or, or something like that. So That would be great. Um, I know Ripple Glass, Ripple Glass was created with the help of the Boulevard people. Um, and I know on, um, on the Ripple Glass purple bins, they have Boulevard printed on there. Um, yeah, that's a great, great idea to contact them and have my logo on their, on their boxes as well.
Cool. And then our final uh, signature question, you know, what can we do as a community? We've got the eyes and ears of um, well over 200 people this morning. What can we do to support you as a community and, and see your success moving forward? Uh, great question. I think just as a community, just the awareness, I think the biggest, the biggest catch up I have or hang up that I have is um, people say, well, I don't use glass and so I don't really need the service. But I guarantee if you went to all, home to all your pantries and looked through your pantry, if you take out the alcohol side of it, which everybody focuses on, um, I, I, my biggest response to uh, me at telling people about my service is, well, I don't drink beer, I don't drink wine. Um, so, well, do you use sauces? Do you use pickles? Do you uh, have vinegar? I mean, so many things come in glass, and glass is kind of the, the wave of the, uh, not that plastic is terrible, but a lot of companies are actually going back to glass in, in a lot of things, uh, a lot of their products. So um, just getting the word out to your friends, your neighbors. Um, if, you, if you don't live in my current zone, letting your friends and neighbors and family, if they live in Olathe, Overland Park, and Leewood, know about our service, that's actually the biggest help. We are, before Ripple Glass started, glass recycling was pretty much nil. I think we were about 6%. Uh, now we're at 15% or a little higher now. The national average is around 34% glass recycling. So I think the curbside aspect of it will really push us up closer to the national average. Um, Ripple Glass is doing a great job of getting lots of those big purple bins out to, for people to drop them off. But I think that curbside will be that extra, that extra boost to get our area up to at least, at least to the national average. So that's all I ask. Get the word out. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Thank you, Hunts. All right, announcements. Um, wait, before I do announcements, what's everybody think of the big board? The big board? All right, you know, we had the big board for uh, our one-year anniversary, and, and thanks to our AV pros back there, Dave and Matt, uh, this is gonna be a regular feature. So welcome to Big Board. And re a reminder, Melissa actually managed to get us shut down off Twitter once because she tweeted so much in an hour. So the, I think the goal is between all of us to like shut down the whole system. So, so do a lot of tweeting. So let's see, announcements, what have we got? Kate, Kate Forstall, come on up here. She's gonna tell us about something amazing with the Arts Council. Keep time. Hi, I'm Kate Forrestall. I'm the Arts KC Fund Director for the Arts Council of Metropolitan Kansas City. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's nice to see some friends in the crowd. First of all, I'm so relieved to be in a room where I can tweet and somebody tweets back at me this fast. And I know nobody's going to raise their hand and ask me what that funny black cube is at the bottom of this piece of paper. So it's wonderful to be in a tech savvy room. And that's why I'm here this morning. Um, the Arts KC Fund, for those of you who don't know, is a United Arts Fund. There are about 60 across the country, and basically what it means is it's a combined annual appeal on behalf of a number of organizations. The Arts Council has had a fund for six years. We're very new, and over that time, we've given away $2.4 million, made about 499 grants. It's about $400,000 a year. For perspective, Cincinnati is going to give away $11 million this year. Milwaukee, same thing. Milwaukee, come on. On. Anyway, we really want to grow the fund, and part of that means moving it outside the workplace giving model, which is really where it's lived. That is um, a model that I think is really shifting as millennials move into the workplace. I think it's we're going to become much more digitized. And so on Friday, we're doing something to hopefully ramp up the fund and access the power of 10. I was at the Americans for the Arts Conference last week, and President Obama's, um, the guy who ran his reelection campaign, said that through digital giving, they raised $750 million, and the average gift was $41. So I really believe that this community can own the arts. When I see, and I, I've worked as an actress, I have worked for Starlight, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, 
These organizations are doing so much work that is hidden. The Shakespeare Festival does 11 camps around the metro area. 40% of the kids at those camps are on scholarship. So what we're doing is, it's all explained here, it's called Time to Give, and we're asking for sponsors for each hour of the longest day of the year. And One Million Cups has offered to be the sponsor for the 9 a.m. slot. So what we would love for all of you to do is use this information here, make a $10 contribution, and encourage anybody you know to also make a $10 contribution. We are funding artist entrepreneurs three times a year, and I know you guys get that and how tough that is. So I would really appreciate your support. I'll be here after the meeting if you have questions. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. All right, as, uh, as you came in this morning, you saw uh, some slides rotating about One Week KC. Uh, there's all sorts of cool stuff going on, so strongly encourage you to be part of that. Just among many things, we've got Startup Crawl, which that involves like going to different places and seeing startups and drinking beer, so that's a plus. Um, our very own George Brooks at Cremalab is hosting Coffee and Design, so ask him about that, that's gonna be cool. And of course, Maker Faire. So, you know, to see things being made and whatever those cool guys at Maker Faire do. And what, you're playing baseball? What's that about? Entrepreneur Day at the K, that's part of it too. So, all right, and just one final thing. Um, for those of you who thought you had a long drive in from Overland Park to be here today, we have a group of folks here from Malaysia. They're here from Young KC <laughs> to um, study entrepreneurship. So if you happen to see them, give them a warm Casey welcome. All right, our next presenter. Now this is kind of interesting because it's a departure a little bit from what we normally talk about. Of course, we talk about tech, we talk about products, but you know, there's a whole other part of you know, our community that uh, you know, is kind of underground and not something that we're directly part of, probably fortunately, and that's the criminal justice system. So our next presenter is uh, Susan McComas, and she has a program called The Rough Path which deals with recidivism and helping uh, former uh, inmates and former uh, uh, inmates, inmates <laughs> folks in the prison system to, uh, to keep them out or keep them from going back into it and, uh, and keep them on the, uh, on the straight and narrow. So as soon as we get our AV figured out. <laughs> oh, no. I'm new. <laughs> Never seen it before. <laughs> PowerPoint. How did we manage to? Honestly. It was up there before. Somehow we've broken it. Maybe we'll just tweet the entire presentation. Got it. Working. We have audio but no video. There we go. Welcome, Susan McComas. At the risk of bringing the mood down in the room a little bit, this is my world. I worked for 30 years as a private investigator and a homicide investigator. And because of that, I've dealt with all the family grief and all the pain that comes with crime. I've also dealt with the people who have done the crime. Currently, there are 2.4 million people in prison in the United States. According to the latest Pew Center report, 44% of those inmates are gonna go back within three years of their release. That's a huge fail rate for the corrections industry. Over one million people are gonna go back behind the walls on a regular basis. Clearly, there's some room for improvement, and corrections in the United States cost the taxpayers $50 billion a year. 90% of the public surveyed in that same Pew report said they wanted more programming and less prison time for nonviolent offenders, and that's where my program comes in. That's the window of opportunity for my product. All these years, I've been listening to these people give me their excuses for why they're where they are. They don't have any accountability for their actions. And what they don't realize is, is that their past is what got them to where they are today, sitting in a courtroom or sitting in a prison. Some of these were actually my clients and some of the attorneys that I worked for, just if you're wondering where the pictures came from. In 2009, I started to do an awareness presentation in prisons called the Four R's. Recognize, regret, reality, and repair. It was really well received by the inmates and the corrections staff that watched it. They all, basically, they, they identified with it. It was straightforward, no psychobabble. It was just about accountability and understanding how to get the fix so they wouldn't keep repeating the same mistakes. The four R's have evolved into the rough path, which is why you're here today. 
It's aimed at inmates in their last year of incarceration. It has an emphasis on being successful in their re-entry and the reasons that most people fail at re-entry. It runs for 18 sessions and it's based on a confrontational model within the prison run by an inmate facilitator, so there's no reason for them to lie about what they feel or how they respond to the questions. Each week they have homework they have to do and they have to bring it back in front of the group and be accountable for their own answers on the self-inventories and the questions that are in, in the workbook. It's going to be marketed nationwide and I also did a conversational Spanish version of it because of the large Hispanic population in the prisons in the United States. I made it so that they could see that we did know where they were going. My own personal story is in it. I was a childhood sex abuse survivor. I don't have any shame in my past, so I put it in the book. I have two men that were inmates that were clients of mine. Their stories are in the book. I have one lady who was another abuse survivor as a child. She's a huge success now. Her story is in the book. You cannot preach to people about how they need to behave unless they know that you understand where they came from. Inmates do not want to hear from somebody who has never been there. This resonates with them at the very heart of where they're coming from. I did a focus group after I got the book done this summer, or this spring, I'm sorry. I got some really good comments back from it I'd like to share with you. Inspiring stories with solid advice anyone can apply to their life. Brutal honesty. Unique, honest, engaging, and straightforward. And my favorite one, yes, I saw my own past in one of the stories. When I got done crying, I got busy healing. I love you for telling it like it is. And that was a 27-year-old man who was suffering from an addiction and had already done two stints in, in prison. When you get people like that, that it hits home with, you got a winner. That 44% recidivism rate has been in place in this country since 1999. The corrections industry is using programs that have been written in the 90s. It doesn't take a genius to figure out it's not working. It's time to do something different. It doesn't stay the same if it's working. It doesn't stay the same. I had a private corrections program consultant review it, and to my mind, she paid me the highest compliment of all. She said, her work is totally different. The existing methods we use don't go into detail in terms of personal matters. She's using learned behavior, it's person-centered, and solution-focused. I can see the entire female dorm working through this book. She runs a woman's prison. The women will identify with her. It is their story. I would love to see their stories end in such a wonderful and healing way. Totally different. She couldn't have paid me a better compliment if she tried. That was what we were trying to do. I also have a personal version that you can sell in any bookstore. The personal version is a little different. It talks about at the end about self-esteem and confidence and going out and making something out of your life after being an abuse victim or a trauma survivor. Otherwise, they're pretty much the same book in the beginning. All the exercises are the same. There's an emphasis on violent behavior and how you cannot do that anymore in the corrections edition. I know you saw my advertising campaign there. When you send that banner to somebody in the corrections industry, they tend to sit up and take notice. <laughs> I have a 10 foot long banner for my conference exhibits that I put that up at. I had people stopping and taking pictures of it. <laughs> and then they asked me what the hell I was doing. Because <laughs> I shook them up a little bit. These are the protocol that it has to meet in order for the corrections industry to be able to purchase it. It has to meet federal Second, Anse Second Chance Act requirements. It does. It has to have evidence-based data protocols in place. I put those in place. And it has to have a cognitive behavior intervention principle. And we did that too. They like it. I sent out the first email blast last two weeks ago, and we got our first sale. Thank you, Mike, for making me do that. All right. This is, a, this is a tough industry to impress. Anybody who's ever worked with corrections people will know they don't, imp they don't impress easily. But when they got the email blast, I got three invitations to present this at conferences across the country this year. So clearly somebody recognizes that there might be something good going on here and that they might need this product. I have the Wardens Conference for the East Coast in October, the Vision Summit Conference in Austin, Texas in September, 
And this weekend, I get invited to present at the National Sheriff's Association Conference in Charlotte. 30,000 people. I love it. I love it. Huge opportunity. Tell you what Mike said, I needed to tell you what I wanted. <laughs> this is what I'd like to have. Help with the public relations campaign of both the corrections and the personal use version. Speaking appearances, book tour, radio, TV interviews, anything to get it out there. I don't know how to do public relations. I just admit it. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. That's why you guys are here. Some investor money to help pay for all that. I've put in over $8,000 out of my own pocket to get this developed. The Spanish translation was $4,000 alone. It's not cheap. And I'm proud at the end of my rope as far as financially goes. I'd like some help with that. The Arnold Foundation down in Texas has reducing recidivism as one of their main goals, but they do not take unsolicited grant inquiries. If anybody can get me a contact at the Arnold Foundation so that I can put my program in front of them for hopefully them to help, I would really appreciate it. That's my wish list. Now you guys are going to have questions. Hit me. And by the way, no one has my permission to visualize me naked in this room, just so we're all clear. <laughs> Powerful Not stuff. Happy. Let's do some questions. Yeah. Uh, who has a question? I think I scared them all half to death. <laughs> It's not nearly as warm and fuzzy as glass recycling. I understand that. <laughs> right here for you. So I'm a little confused about um, whether you're a nonprofit or whether you're a for-profit business. For-profit. OK. So you're looking for grant funding? No, the Arnold Foundation, I, I'm not looking for grant funding. The Arnold Foundation um, has, this as one of their, has this as one of their primary goals. And I feel like if they could review it and endorse it, it would help boost the, uh, the program's possibility. My other question is, do you do this outside of the prison population environment? Do you, like, do you work with ex-offenders in support groups or anything like that, or help uh, do kind of train the trainer type um, they don't. Um, they don't have a um, mechanism in place to do that. You can offer it, but honestly, when they're on parole, they're mandated to do so many programs that uh, they wouldn't come into this voluntarily. Um, you have to understand the mindset on that. When someone comes out on parole, if they're a sex offender, they're required to continue their sex offender training. If they're a violent offender, they have violent offender classes they have to go to, and they have to pay for all that out of their own pocket, including the intervention fee on top of that. So the parole board has enough stuff in place for them to do. This is designed for them to do while they're still inside. I guess I'm, I'm just saying that maybe you could partner with some organizations that serve ex-offenders and provide this training and maybe that might help them. <laughs> well, the problem with that is they're inundated with stuff when they come out. Just day-to-day -day survival and holding down a job is a big deal. And when they, oh, they, well, I'm trying to answer your question. When the organizations try and help them, they're helping them to get a job. They're helping them to get home. They're helping them to get a car sometimes, not usually. Usually they get a bus pass. And if they're lucky, they can go to an AA meeting. They're, they're, you're looking at very basic survival skills here once somebody's released. It's um, to ask them to voluntarily do an in-depth psychological program, it's not going to happen. They've got too much on their plate already. So, so I have a question here. I think you touched on a, a bit about what your program actually offers, but talk a little bit more about you. I think you touched on the accountability factors. Can you go a little bit deeper into how yours is different than the other you know, 20 programs that they might get inundated on the way out? How, what are you trying to prepare them with before? What is that, you know, just some kind of hard most, facts there. Most programs don't touch on why people fail in reentry. They don't give them the five biggest factors of why they end up coming back. And it all comes down to, I think, when they come out initially, they're scared to go back. They have a lot of uh, programming in place as far as goals and what they want to do. And then six, eight months later, that starts to evaporate a little bit, and they start to slide back into their old behaviors. Most of them reoffend or get a technical violation for parole 
between two and three years. It's not immediate. And unless you change the behavior pattern and you teach people that they have to sever those old relationships and sever those old behavior patterns, they're going to slide back into it. I mean, that, if you talk to any parole officer, they're going to tell you it's not necessarily a new crime. It's that after a couple of years, they start drinking again, they start running with their old buddies, they start looking at crime as an alternative for an income because they're tired of being broke, and all the old patterns of behavior come back. Another question back uh, to your right. First off, well done. And uh, second, I was curious about present, or if you do this in the juvenile courts as well, uh, where the problems generally start at the younger ages, especially folks, maybe first time entries, if that was something you were focusing on. Uh, this program is not appropriate for juveniles. Juveniles have a whole different um, schism of programs already in place. I actually volunteered at the Jackson County Juvenile Center, talking to the kids once a month as a volunteer speaker. And they're dealing with a whole different uh, issue of just trying to stay in school, and their home stability is so poor that the juvenile people are working sort of backwards to get them some stable environment so that they don't end up in the big system and end up here. It's more intervention at their level. But they do have a lot of good stuff in place already. All right, Suzanne, I have a question for you. Um, from my limited understanding, um, gangs are a vital part of the prison population. It's a survival sort of thing. Um, how does your program factor into that and help them get out of that gang lifestyle when they're outside of prison? When we design the administrative forms for this program, part of that is, is they have to be screened by the administrative staff to come into the program. If their mindset isn't right at the beginning, they're not allowed to participate. If they're immersed in the gang life out in the yard, they stay there because they're not ready to listen. And they're not paying, they're doing anything, but they're just paying lip service to the programs so that the staff will get off their back and they'll get some privileges. So unless they're screened in and they're admitted to the program, they can't come in. They have to come in in the right frame of mind. They have to want the change. You can't make people fix themselves. But you can keep them from coming into the program and wasting everybody's time. So anyone that's a confirmed gang member out on the yard, if they're not willing to step out of that activity and come into something that's going to help them before they get out, they don't come into this to begin with. There's no point. Question to your left. Hi, I understand uh, who benefits from the program. I was wondering if you knew who the actual purchasers would be. Is it the wardens or prisons themselves, or is it the government that mandates the prisons to have that program? Because I'm wondering the benefit to actually talking directly to prisons, because I, I believe they're responsible for the people inside the prison, not necessarily what they do after they leave the prison. Well, the, the program's presented inside their facility, so they do purchase it themselves for placement. And we have three different kinds of facilities in this country. We have county level, who now are being mandated for reentry programs because a lot of the guys never go to the state prison because of crowding. So the county sheriffs are being mandated to put in programs in place where they weren't 10 years ago. Anybody under five years, they very rarely leave the county jail. They stay there for their whole bit. So we have the sheriffs, and they do have the purchasing power to purchase directly for their institution. The state-level prisons do have the ability to purchase directly for their institution. And then private industry prisons, which are a growing um, you know, section of the company here, there are three companies that run those, and they have purchasing power themselves too. Um, the one exception to that is the BOP, federal prisons. You do have to go through the federal purchasing for that, because that's across the board. That's not an individual basis. Um, this is priced under $1,000 per set, and then they just buy the workbooks as the guys work through them. So it doesn't hit uh, the price point for states where they would have to go out for bids or anything where it's over $5,000. Back here in the middle. Um, hi. You said that this program was like something that is like voluntary for people to do it. Do Are inmates willing to do this program, and what's the success rate of it? They are willing to do it, like it's a brand new program, so when I said the evidence-based data protocols are in place, that runs for two years. At the end of two years, you go back and cross-check the people that have gone into it, and how many of them have gone back, and how many of them are still out and successful on their parole. 
So as far as the success rate, brand new, can't give it to you. As far as them coming into it voluntarily, I think you'd be surprised how many of the guys don't, and, and women, don't want to go back, but they don't know where to start. And if the warden or the sheriff gives them the opportunity to do something like this, they will come into it. They will come into it. The county jails in particular are very, very limited for programming. Um, they're set up differently as far as staffing and the time they have available. So this is ideal for them because they can just run it with either one staff member or actually have one of the inmates facilitate it once he's trained. And the facilitating is very simple. The manual was written so that anybody could do it. They basically just take charge of it. It has their homework assignments in it, and they don't allow people to argue or insult each other. It has to be a, a valid discussion of what they're covering each week. Suzanne, we got a question for you right here in the middle. Do you think that the fail rate for systems is some kind of a maybe revenue generating guarantee? And is there a government kind of goal to encourage re-entry and not coming back to the prison? And would that help your program? Well, you know, the inmates say that uh, they want them to fail because it's job security. You know, <laughs> that's the inmate view on it. My view on it is, is that it's an excuse, okay? If you take 200 people in this room and you know that everybody on this side of the room is going to go back, everybody over here is going to be looking at them going, what are you doing? You know, you'd rather be back in there? They're all the excuses in the world, all the excuses in the world. The inmates are completely in ownership of that 44% fail rate. I'm sorry, they just are. They are. The corrections industry is mandated with two things. Hold them accountable and isolate them from society. That's their only job. They isolate them in giant buildings. They hold them accountable because they have no privileges. And then it's on them to change their behavior so that they don't come back. It, it, you have to put the ownership of that recidivism rate on the people that are going back. And each one of the states has addressed this a little differently. Uh, Oregon, in particular, has decided that they're not going to revoke people for parole violations. They're not going to send them back. What they're going to do is they're going to put them in a more intensive parole program. In other words, we're going to make you a little miserable out here. And if you're still going to go ahead and act out, then we're going to send you back. So Oregon's rate has gone down to like 22%, because just making them a little more miserable for their behavior out here has caused them to change their behavior. Other states are like, if you want to do it, let's see what you got. And within two years, they get a technical violation, one violation, and they're back in for the rest of their bit. So yes, it's job security, but ultimately, you know, the inmates have to, they have to take ownership of that. They just do. Back here to your left. Continuing down that cold, dark path of that last question, how do you sell this to private prisons if the profit motive is well, in the opposite of... They're still, they're still mandated because they're taking federal and state funds to house their prisoners, so they're mandated to provide programming, just like everybody else. So GEO and Correction Corps have to have evidence-based programming in place. And I've actually already talked to the vice president of GEO that does the programs, and he's interested in it once I get a year's worth of evidence. So they do have to have them in place, or they don't get the federal money and the state money for, for housing the prisoners. Yes, sir. Another one right back here. When Jackson County put in the drug docket, uh, we started doing like mass pleas, uh, and we would literally line up people and do like 30 at a time. And as we would question them, we'd hear, listen to the, their story a little bit, and we'd find that, you know, if you found somebody that had a, a sophomore, completed their sophomore year in high school, that was a red letter day. It was just incredible. And then you'd hear the, the, the absolute breakdown in their family. So somehow, you found a way to get them to take the first step and look at themselves and hold themselves accountable well, what and ask themselves the questions and, and then open them up for education. And I assume that you're, you're, you, and I guess that's my question, do you then push them on to as a, like a, a GED and then maintain some kind of family or post-care contact with them to bring them up? For them to come into the program, they have to have already gotten their GED within the prison walls. That's the first requirement because it's written at high school level. And actually, if you look at any of the programs that are in place in corrections, the GED is, in, is required for all of them because they have to be able to read. So 
They already have the GED. That's the only thing they normally have. And I think the approach that I took was, yes, you had a horrible childhood. I get it. Yes, your home life sucked. I get it. Guess what? You're 32 years old now, and you're on your own, and you're making your own decisions, and you're running your own life. You're in charge, just like everybody else in here is in charge of their own life. So if you want to keep looking back and blaming what happened to you when you were 10 years old for why you're doing a burglary when you're at the age of 32, I have no time for that. I have no time for that. You're making a decision to do a crime against somebody else who doesn't even know who you are because of something that happened to you when you were 10. And I think that, that everybody has to understand, you know, the thing that they don't realize is they look at people like you and they say, well, none of you guys ever had any problems. You never went through anything, so you don't know what I'm going through. Well, you know what? Everybody in this room has gone through stuff. They've lost loved ones. They've gone through illness. They've lost children. They've had grief in their life. They've had stress. But you all had coping mechanisms to deal with it. And that's why you're successful in life. But they don't see that. They think everyone in here had a, has a silver spoon. You're a bunch of yuppies. You got money. You got people. You got nice houses. You, got, you don't know me. You don't know me. Well, yeah, we do. That's why we put the stories in there. That's why we put the stories in there. They can't argue with me. They can't argue with the people that are in the book. Because we all had crappy backgrounds, and we fixed it. We rose above it when we were adults. So they have to, too. They have to take ownership of their own behavior. I'm afraid to look at that wall. <laughs> I don't even want to know what's up there. I don't even want to know what's up there. It's all good stuff. Is and it good? Suzanne, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Let's give a hand for Suzanne in the rough path. All right, we've, we've held you all for a couple extra minutes. Thank you for being patient, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Michael.